So we're going on to talk about the vibrational spectroscopy of polyatomic molecules, where polyatomic includes any molecule which has got more than two atoms. When we only have two atoms to worry about, there's clearly only one vibrational mode. Right? We've got one atom moving with respect to another one, and they can only move along one axis. As soon as we have more atoms, then of course we can also have more vibrational modes. That is, atoms can, remove, can move with respect to all of the other atoms in the molecule. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is how many vibrational modes do we have to worry about in a polyatomic molecule? Well, when we think of vibrations, we think of the movement of nuclei. And we can specify exactly the position of all of the nuclei in the molecule if we have three n coordinates. If there are n atoms, then we can specify exactly their position in space with three Cartesian coordinates. So if, if we want to talk about the motions of all of the nuclei, then we have three n possibilities to worry about, but not more than that. But it turns out that we actually we don't need even that many, because some of those motions are not going to be vibrational motion. We're only interested in the vibrations of the molecule. So we're only interested really in the motion of the nuclei with respect to the center of the mass of the molecule. And so we can determine the center of mass of the molecule with just three coordinates x, y, and z for the center of the mass. Those three coordinates can't be involved in the vibration. So actually the maximum number of vibrational modes that we're going to have to worry about is 3n minus 3. Okay, but that's just for the translation. Also, you can imagine using coordinates in x and y, that's just the rotation. We're not interested in the rotations of the molecules either. We're only interested in the vibrations. So we're going to specify the center of the mass of the molecule with three coordinates, and then we're going to specify its orientation in space, whether it's pointing in the x, y, or z direction. To do that, we need another three coordinates. So in general, for a molecule, we need three n minus six coordinates. That means there can only be three n minus six vibrational modes that we have to worry about. There's a slight exception to that. That's true for nonlinear molecules. But if we have a linear molecule, and we want to specify its orientation in space. For a linear molecule, there's an extra mode of vibration. 3n minus 5 vibrational modes for a linear molecule, 3n minus 6 vibrational modes for a nonlinear molecule. So diatomic molecules, for example, are necessarily linear. n is equal to 2, diatomic. So 3n minus 5 is equal to 1 mode. OK, so here's an example of the vibrational modes for an n is equal to 3 molecule. So I'm going to pick the CO2 molecule to start with. CO2 is a linear molecule. So the number of modes is going to be 3 times n, 3, minus 5. So that gives us four modes. Vibrational modes are movement with respect to the center of mass of the molecule. So the vibrational modes that we have to draw for the CO2 molecule must keep the center of mass in the same place. So that piece of information tells us how to draw the mode. So here we've got stretching mode. That's where the, the two oxygen atoms are moving out and in, and they're moving in phase. So we refer to that as the symmetric stretching mode. This symmetric stretching mode you cannot observe in the infrared because there's a little bond dipole associated with the carbon and oxygen because those nuclei have different electronegativities. And there's an opposite one on the other side. In that symmetric mode, they always cancel each other out because as one oxygen moves out, the other oxygen moves out. So the net dipole always remains as zero and there's no change in dipole during the vibration. So that vibration exists, it's a real mode of the molecule, but it's an infrared inactive mode. It's actually observed in the Raman spectrum. And there's another stretching mode, that's the so-called asymmetric stretch. That's where as one oxygen comes out, the other oxygen comes in. So that one's going in, out, and then it turns around and comes the other way. Of course, we have to keep the center of mass of the molecule in the same position. So when both of the oxygen atoms are moving in that direction, then that carbon atom has to move to the right because the center of mass has to be preserved. We don't want the molecule to translate. It's only vibrating. Let's have a look at what happens to the dipole moment. As that comes in, that bond gets shorter, and as that goes out, that bond gets longer. So if the charges on the two oxygen atoms are the same, then the dipole moment is going to start off at zero, where the two bond lengths are equal. Then we're going to have a finite dipole moment here, and then it's going to turn around and we're going to have a finite, we're going to go through zero again, and then we'll have a finite dipole moment pointing in the opposite direction. So on average, of course, because CO2 is a symmetric molecule, then on average, the dipole moment is always zero. But during this vibration, the dipole moment is fluctuating. So during the vibration, the dipole moment is changing. So delta mu is not equal to zero during the vibration, even though mu is on average zero. So this vibration, since there is a change in the dipole moment during the vibration, can be observed in the infrared spectrum.
Okay, so those are the two stretching vibrations of the CO2 molecule, but we still need four modes, and we've only drawn two so far. It turns out that there are actually two bending modes, where here the oxygen atoms are moving up, and to, of course to balance that movement up, since the center of mass has to remain the same, then the carbon atom is moving down. So we end up with a bent state. That bent state, right, because there's a charge difference along this bond, then that has a dipole moment associated with it as well, pointing down. That relaxes, going back the other way, we go through zero again, and then the oxygens move down, the other half of the vibration, and in that case we have a dipole moment pointing up. So on average, again, the dipole moment is zero, but the dipole is fluctuating, changing, during this vibration. So this bending mode is also allowed in the infrared region of the spectrum, and it will be observed. Okay, the other bending mode is actually identical to that, but it's coming out of the plane, the paper. So those two have identical energies. We refer to those as degenerate vibration, and yet we have to have both of them. Not just because we need four modes, but it's what we're saying when we say that there are four modes in the CO2 molecule. We're saying that we can describe every possible motion of the nuclei that you can imagine. For the CO2 molecule to do that, you actually need both of these vibrations. But of course, we'll only see two peaks in the infrared spectrum, one of them associated with this degenerate pair, and one of them associated with the anti-symmetric stretch.